happy Thursday. I have neural coffee in hand and it is perfect. <laughs> I have a question. Okay. No one minds. Uh, so in regards to um, early versus late propulsion, um, my impression is posteriorly on the hip, it's concentric yielding for both of them. Um, but I know there's a difference um, because the foot is different. Um, and so I was, regard I was wondering in regards to like the ischial tuberosity, um, exactly what is going on there between the two. Because I'm trying to connect exactly. the two. Roughly. Okay. So I'm trying to take that the hip. Hang on. Sorry, sorry, well, hang on. Let, let's let's just talk this through. Mm -hmm. Let's make an assumption that we're moving forward. Okay. Is that fair? Right. That's how we know that both sides are concentric. Because they're going in the same direction. So I have so the so the, the muscle orientation has to be the same if I'm going in the same direction, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. If I'm walking, so I'm stepping. Right, so one foot is going ahead of the other, you know, in a reciprocal fashion. Okay, to get one foot ahead of the other, the one side has to slow down to allow the other one to be faster. Okay, now knowing what we know about the the rate of load on connective tissues, that's how we determine an overcoming versus a yielding strategy. Right, mm -hmm. and so so if if I have a delay on one side and it's concentrically oriented, so it's still moving forward. It's just gonna move forward at a slower rate. It means I gotta pop out the parachute on that side to slow that side down so the other side can get ahead, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So then that becomes concentric yielding on that side, okay? As I, as I move the other side forward, right? I'm still concentric because we're all going in the same direction, okay? But because I need that to go faster, then those connective tissues are gonna be loaded at a higher rate, which means I'm gonna have an overcoming action. Okay. So far, so good? So far, so good. Okay. So if I'm creating a delay on, on one side, so, at, so, so think about, so as, as the first metatarsal head on the, let's just say the right foot, okay? To make life simple, we'll, we'll make a very specific example here. When the first med head hits the ground, on the right foot, okay? The foot doesn't move. It's no longer going forward, right? So that means that's the side I gotta slow down on. So that's where I start to yield. I actually begin my yielding action at that point when the first metatarsal head hits the ground, okay? So all the way up. So all the way from the foot up through the pelvis, into the axial skeleton, up into the thorax. That side is starting to yield, so it's holding back, okay? Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing that, if I'm doing that, then um, to advance the other side, then I have to compress that posterior lower aspect on the left side to get it to go forward, right? Because yeah. I have to get the spine to turn we're talking about the, the right yield, I have to get the spine to turn to the right, okay? And I, and I would do that through the lowest part of the spine, which would be the sacrum, right? So that ischial tuberosity is being compressed closer to the, to the sacrum. I have external rotation of the femur, right? And so if you think about like the... I could probably just show you. Uno momento. You guys know how to pin the video so you, so you can blow it up on your screen if you need to. You go to the upper right-hand corner of my little, little box. There's a three-dot thing, and you can pin it so it make, it'll make it bigger. So I need the spine to turn that way, which means I need to compress this. And this has to be an ER, so it's going to do that. See it? So everything goes like that. So I get my turn, I get my yield over here, I get my overcoming here. See it? Got it? Make sense? Yes. Cool. Bill, can you elaborate a little bit on, on how this changes when you're accelerating to something versus decelerating? Because, I mean, does it just make a, basically a bigger parachute on the backside 
so that you're not slowing or you're not uh, I guess you're delaying more so you need a, a, essentially that bigger expansion on the back side. Okay, so ooh, I don't like that feedback. Um, if so you're talking about like if I was running forward and I had to like come to a stop or change directions. Right, like sports, it's all well and good to analyze this gotcha. straight line, 100 meter gotcha. dash, but. Yeah, okay. Do I need to stop my forward movement? Eventually, if you're gonna change direction, yeah. Okay, if I'm gonna come to a stop, if I'm so if I'm running forward and I wanted to run backward, right? Or I even can, if, yeah, if you just wanted to come to a stop. Okay, so if I gotta come to a stop, what, what, what movement do I need, ER or IR? If you want to come to a stop, if yes, you decelerate, sir. you're going to need ER. Oh, really? If I'm going to stop, what's what movement stops motion, IR yeah. or ER? IR. Thank you. So, why do you lower your center of gravity when you when you come to a stop or change direction? So you can put force into the ground. So I can capture a position of internal rotation, right? Then I can put force into the ground. If I try to put force into the ground in an ER position, I have a sprained ankle, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so now think about what, what you're asking me. So we step into it. There's, a, there's certainly a delay when I first make my initial contact. So, so I make my initial contact with the ground to decelerate, change direction, or whatever it might be. Same process that I was just talking about, about creating the delay strategy, right? So I will be in an early propulsive strategy. However, if I'm going to come to a stop, the amount of force that I have to apply to the ground is radically different from me just stepping over with the other foot and continuing to walk, which means that, that now I'm gonna, so remember when I flip flop the mechanics from standing bipedal to quadruped? Mm -hmm. So now I just flip flop my mechanics because I'm, I'm bending the hip more. I'm lowering my center of gravity like a squat. And now I got it. Now I got to produce more force into the ground in internal rotation. So that not only sense. did I have to initiate the delay with an early propulsive strategy, I got to get to mid max propulsion to stop, which is max IR into the ground. Right, yep. so my foot position is going to be different. I'm going to have a, I'm going to get all the way to max P probably, right? If depending on how fast I'm going, mm -hmm. right? And and so does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So where's the pair? So if I'm lowering my center of gravity, if I'm going to like cut, change direction, or just pure pure deceleration into the ground, where's the parachute now? So in early propulsion. I have a counter nutated sacrum on an ER ilium, right? That's where the parachute is. That's where I slow down. That's the expansion. As I lower my center of gravity and try to come to a complete stop and jam force into the ground, where's the parachute now? It's going to be lower posterior. Absolutely. So now I actually flip flop the position of my sacrum. I flip flop the position of the ilium because I have to create that that much stronger expansion in the, in the posterior outlet of the pelvis. Otherwise, I can't stop. So yeah, so it's not a bigger parachute. It's just where where is it? Basically? Where is the parachute? That is correct. Absolutely. There Based on kind of what you were talking about earlier, and that not that it's trial and error, but in the sake of Nate, and I think more so even for Borbala, in the sake of myself, I'm just trying to figure out and piece some of this stuff together. Of like, okay, what do the shapes look like? What do I need to do to alter those shapes? Um, in some ways, it feels like I'm just playing with my clients, and I don't know that they would necessarily want that. Not that. Why not? I don't know. I, I guess I'm ex I'm I'm placing more expectation that they're putting expectation on me. Right. They, they think want to see no. change there, and they're identifying something as progress. And if they're not seeing that, right. or I'm not actually communicating that I don't actually know what I'm doing fully well. Hey, Grace, can I let you know a secret? Sure. I don't know what I'm doing either. That's not true, though. It is true. It's relative, Grace. It OK, so so here's the deal. <clears throat> um, you've been you've been working three years. Yeah. OK, so I'm I have 10 times the experience. <clears throat> 
couch. Doesn't mean you don't know anything. It just means that my ability to, to shift the probabilities in my favor is better. That's sure. it. That's it. So 86% of the time, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm more likely to have the outcome that I want. Right. Okay. You don't have that percentage yet. Yes. Okay. Do you think, do you think that I experiment with my clients? Yes. Absolutely. I do. Because <laughs> I don't know what the answer is going to be. This is one of the things that people have to get, have to get comfortable with. So this is a byproduct of working in the complex domain. So the complex domain means that there is a cause and effect. We just don't know what it is. And we can sometimes figure that out after the fact. That's why I always say test, figure out what you're looking at from your perspective and then do something safe and then see what happens. Because I don't know what the see what happens is. Sure. Okay. You don't either. That's, that is a byproduct of working in complexity. Because I don't know what, I don't know what anyone's experience is up to the point that they start working with me. Sure. It's like they've lived a life. They have perceptions. They have beliefs. They have behaviors, right? I have no idea how that's going to influence the outcome. If somebody doesn't like the color of my room, I'll fail. I might not know it's the color of my room ever, but what if it's that? Sure. Right? Because I don't know. Trial and error exists because it's very scientific, <laughs> right? What you're gonna do over time though, is instead of having like only two possibilities of influence, you're gonna say, I have 12 possibilities of influence. My experience tells me that these three over here are more likely to get the outcome that, that I want. But what if those three don't work? Then I've got nine other possibilities that I might be able to influence that I can slowly superimpose and say, I'm gonna do this one and see what happens. And I go back and I wait and I go, oh, that's exactly what I wanted. I'm gonna do more of that, okay? Mm -hmm. Or it doesn't work. Okay, take that one out. What's the next one? It doesn't mean you don't, see, that's when you know what you're doing. See, that's the thing that people don't, don't grasp. It's, 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 like, it's like, that's how you work with, with a complex system is, is that I'm narrowing probabilities and I have to try to understand as many possible influences as I can. So 27 years from now, when you're on your Zoom call with your, with your people, right? They, they want to come on and they, they want to see what Grace is talking about, okay? They're going to have the same problem, right? Because they've been looking at the cookbook and the recipe said, do this. And then the recipe didn't work, Yeah. right? And you're going to say, oh, well, there's 36, when I say 12 things, you're going to go, oh, there's 37 things that you have to consider now, <laughs> Right. But these six will be the ones that you're probably going to want to do under this circumstance, because based on my experience, it's more likely that those six are, are going to be be uh, providing the outcome that you're looking for. Right. Because you're so, starting from a higher level. That's why I gave you 37 instead of 12. 